Hey everyone, thanks for joining this stream. Um, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Brent, I'm a backend developer. I work for a company called Spasi in Belgium. And I mainly work on Laravel projects and a significant amount of open source packages. I'm also a blogger. My blog is called stitcher.io. And I'm a little bit of what some might call an author since I'm writing a book on how Laravel projects can be improved by applying DDD principles on them instead of following the best practices provided by the Laravel community. You can read it today, again on my blog, it's called Laravel Beyond Crud. Finally, you can find me on Twitter, so if you have any question that you uh, want to ask me, uh, you can reach me over there. So, the visual perception of code. Today, I'll argue that how your code looks uh, will have an immense influence, and not only on yourself, but also on your colleagues and friends, developers. Now, to be honest, it's a difficult topic to talk about, and that's for many reasons. For one, how something looks, beautiful and structured or not, is very subjective. It's an opinionated and personal thing to talk about. It's also controversial because there are standards. Is it okay to argue against them? And third, it's a topic that for many people is out of their comfort zone. People are used to their way of writing their code and there often doesn't seem to be the need to change that. However, I also mention studies and facts today, trying to prove to you that it's more than just an opinion. And I hope that by reasoning together, we can touch some topics that you haven't thought about before in this way, and it can broaden your thinking. Now, before diving into these topics, we have to take a look at the exact problem. As professional programmers, we're writing a lot of code, but we're reading and scanning even more. To name a few obvious examples, reading documentation, doing code reviews or finding your way in legacy code bases. But our own code also fits in this list. Ask yourself how many minutes a day you're actually typing code and compare that to the amount of time spent reading and figuring things out, trying to understand what's actually written. This reading and scanning, it requires a part of your attention. It puts a load on your brain. It's a thing you need to focus on. And I like to put it like this. Reading and scanning code requires a certain amount of human memory space. And that memory can't be used for anything else. And as an official term, this human memory space is also called cognitive load. A formal definition says that cognitive load refers to the total amount of mental effort being used in the working memory of your brain. And the more we can reduce this cognitive load, the more space there is to focus on, for example, application logic. And you know that's the thing your clients actually pay you to do. Now, there are many things we can do to reduce this cognitive load to improve the visual perception of code. At first, we're going to look at pure aesthetics. And these are changes you can make on your screen. Now, this is the easy part because it has nothing to do with changing the code itself. We'll start with fonts. Let's, uh, let's take a look at an example. Now, during this live stream, we'll mainly work with this piece of code. It's taken from a package I wrote at Spasi. And currently, the font configuration is the following. Uh, it has a font family of current new, font size of 14 pixels and line height of 16. So let's review it once more. And now I'm going to propose another font configuration. As you can see, the text is much more readable. You don't have to squint your eyes as much as before. Uh, easier to read text reduces cognitive load because you don't have to focus as much on the reading itself. So we're freeing up memory space. If you're interested in this particular font configuration, this is it. Uh, but of course, you're free to work out what's best for you. But notice especially how much larger the font size and line height are. Now, some of you might be thinking that there's less code on the screen and that you don't like that. But let's think about that for a moment. What's the value of having a smaller font? 
You could say there's more things to see at once. But in reality, being able to see more code on your screen doesn't mean you're able to understand what's on that screen any faster or better. It's actually more difficult to know where to focus because there's much more points to focus on. Being able to see too much code means it increases cognitive load. And this brings us to the second visual change I personally use all the time, and that's code folding. So let's take a look at the example, the same code again. As you can see, more methods are visible on the screen, but their implementation is hidden. Now code folding, it has a few advantages. You can keep the method signatures close by, but uh, implementation hidden until needed. And that's less things screaming for your attention. Also, you probably work with an IDE or editor, which can list the structure of classes to quickly jump to. And you can see that same structure very easy with folded methods, but with the added benefit of color coding. So it's easier to navigate. Now, if you're using code folding, there's one remark though, and that is that key bindings are required. For this to really work, you need proper key bindings to collapse and unfold, but also to jump between methods and white spacing. Now, this is the current example with better fonts and code folding. And there's one more change I want to propose to make this code easier to read, and that are colors. Now, this could very well be one of the more sensitive topics, but bear with me for just a few minutes. Instead of doing this, I propose to do this, a light team. Now, since the early rise of computers, people have been doing research on what colors are the easiest to work with on screens. For example, there's a guy called Etienne Grandjean who wrote a paper on this exact topic and it's called Ergonomic Aspects of Visual Display Terminals. It turns out that a dark text on light backgrounds is easier to read than the opposite because the dark parts automatically draw your subconscious attention. Now, many people tell me that a light color scheme hurts their eyes and it's important to note that the brightness of your screen isn't the same as the contrast of the text. In this case, for example, I'm using a color scheme created by Mozilla for their dev tools. And a lot of research went into picking these colors to make them have very high contrast. Now, that doesn't mean that the brightness of your screen must always be a hundred percent. Light teams are actually more easy to read on a dimmed screen compared to dark ones. It's the brightness that hurts your eyes and not the contrast. I would really encourage you to just try it out for a week. Uh, I personally got used to a light team in just a few days and since then never wanted to go back. It's of course a little personal, I understand that, but remember, easier to read the text reduces cognitive load. So to recap. In this first part, we looked at things you can do to make the code on your screen more readable. And this was the easy part because no other people are affected by these changes. Next up, we'll talk about the structure of code. And as you can imagine, this is the more difficult part because now we're messing with things others are also affected by. Let's talk about curly brackets first. As web developers, you're probably aware that people don't read websites, they rather scan it. And that scanning usually happens from left to right, top to bottom. Now the same can be applied to large pieces of code. You're not always reading every single character, you're scanning for patterns. The easier it is to find these patterns, the less time you spend looking around your code trying to find that one specific thing. Now with scanning and cognitive load in mind, you can probably already tell what's wrong with this piece of code. The argument list is the problem. There's a lot of information there and it's pushed to the right. Now remember, we're approaching this from a visual perspective. We're not looking at the logic of the code itself. But how do we solve this? One solution could be structuring the argument list like this, pulling the arguments to the left. But this approach doesn't really scale when you're refactoring. For example, making this constructor a static constructor instead, you can see the alignment breaking. 
Another approach could be something like this, but now you're introducing several points of focus in your code. And I can visualize this by drawing some lines. Like so. Does the function start and end? The first and third arguments align with the method body and the second and fourth don't really align to anything? Another issue with this approach is that there's no real guideline on how to group arguments. But two, per three, what about an uneven number of arguments? So moving on to what seems like the only consistent yet easy to understand way of structuring the argument list. Now some of you might already see the problem, but I want to make this really clear. So let's replace all code with axis to see its structure. Can you see how difficult it is to spot where the argument list ends and where the method body starts? There's the curly bracket at the right, it, it indicates the end of the argument list, but the right side isn't where our focus is by default. So it turns out there's one true place where to put that curly bracket on a new line. Now this visual boundary creates a pattern that we can scan for. And this is the end result. Now, by the way, this example isn't my own. It's made by a guy called Kevlin Henney. Uh, he's a programmer and a writer, and he has a very good eye for these kinds of visual patterns. So if you want to know more, definitely go check him out. When you start focusing on visual patterns in your code, you'll discover that you're already using some. And this is one of the most important reasons there's a style guide provided by the FIG. It's called PSR2 and PSR12. But most likely, there still are some places in your code where you don't actively look for patterns. And those are the places which take the longest time to search for specific things. So try to think about that the next time you're coding. Try to recognize places in your code that could be better structured making it easier to scan for patterns in them. And also talk about this with your team to make it consistent. Now moving on to the last two points, I want to let the code do most of the talking, so to speak. You probably already saw the doc blocks for each method in the examples. Uh, this function puts a process into progress. Now you should ask yourself, is this doc block necessary? What information does it share that we cannot write in the code itself? Nothing. It has no added value at all. This code should be type hinted instead of adding redundant doc blocks. Type hints aren't enough to fully remove doc blocks to have this self-documented code though. You also have to name things properly. A name is such a powerful tool, it can carry a lot of meaning and business context that you'd otherwise need documentation for. Now before making the last changes to our example code, let me quickly tell you a story. At PHP Benelux 2018, uh, Terence Ryan gave a talk, it was called Go for PHP Developers, and he showed us this example. Now he immediately addressed a problem for the non-Go developers in the room. This code had very unclear names, so he changed it. And afterwards, I asked him why there was this naming convention in Go to make all variables as short as possible. And he said that's just the way the core team does it and they enforce it during code reviews at Google. So naturally, those conventions were also used by the community. The real reason behind short names has of course an origin. Small terminals, screens 40 years ago. But luckily for us, we're not writing on those screens anymore. Technology has evolved past that. But still, instead of choosing names which can be easily understood by humans, Go has this culture of making names as short as possible without any good reason besides preference. So what about our example? If a better name makes the code more readable, if it saves a fraction of a second of brain time, and with cognitive load in mind, shouldn't we just use them? Is there really an argument against them? I don't think so. For example, name the process variable actually process instead of proc and let the method name actually say what it's going to do. Put that process in progress. We have to be smart and skip the mental translation from abstract to concrete names. It's a burden every time we read our code. When you name something, it always seems obvious to you 
at that moment, right? But does it still, after a day or a week, do you need DocBlocks to explain what the code does or is it clear by its name? And not only to you, but also to the ones who have to work in your legacy code base once you're done. Two more examples. Does this class mean a user was created, an event, uh, or does it represent the mail that's sent out when that event happens, or maybe it's the name of a notification? Let's just skip the possibility for confusion altogether and use explicit names. So the last one, is this a command to create a user? Is it a request class containing the validation rules or is it uh, a job which creates a user? Again, let's not waste time thinking about this. Spend your brain power on more important stuff. If you're thinking along, you might think of namespaces as a solution instead of longer names. And there's two problems with that solution though. First, there's the issue of naming conflicts. And here's an obvious example taken from Laravel. And mind you, these are actually community accepted standards. Here we have a model and a resource. Now, a resource is a class that transforms models to JSON responses for API calls. Um, and these two classes are very often used within the same context. So you almost always have to import one with an alias. That's a lot of work and overhead when using proper names would solve this issue altogether. For example, we could call the user resource class user resource and be done with it. The other problem with namespaces is that they only make clear what class you're actually dealing with at the top of your file as a use statement. Can you tell from this example whether we're dealing uh, with a user model or a user resource? You can't. You'll have to scroll to the top or inspect the variable with your IDE to know. Again, that's lots of overhead. All of this to say that namespaces aren't the solution. We still need to use proper names. So there were a lot of things in a short amount of time. Like I said at the start of this talk, uh, my goal was to make you think about cognitive load. I want to encourage you to start looking for patterns, aesthetics, good names and so on in your own code. And naturally, I'd love to see how that code looks. I always enjoy looking over someone's shoulder to see how they have configured their IDE uh, and how they write code. So if you're up for it, send me a screenshot of your code on Twitter. And with that being said, thanks for your attention. Thanks for joining this live stream. Uh, if you have any questions, send them to me over Twitter and you can check out this presentation on my website. Thank you.